much appreciate the opportunity to speak to everybody today. And I thank everyone uh, for listening in. I thank Dr. Medelitz for also helping to organize this and uh, for my colleagues at FIMSO for helping to connect us. I, uh, as Jay said, I've, uh, I'm an analyst with the Jamestown Foundation. Uh, we've been writing on Boko Haram since 2010, which is essentially when uh, that uh, insurgency hit high gear when they first car started carrying out attacks. And uh, we've been following it uh, closely since then. Uh, more recently, I've also uh, traveled to Nigeria, Niger, Chad, and Cameroon to gain local perspectives on how uh, people in the region uh, view, view that insurgency. And I've uh, put together a few articles for the West Point CTC Sentinel to also uh, elaborate on um, some of my analysis uh, about what's driving the, the insurgency. But what I think is uh, lacking uh, somewhat in uh, general discussion about Boko Haram or uh, northern Nigeria are some of the, uh, particularly in, in the regular media, is uh, some of the issues uh, related to, you know, who, who are these Boko Haram members, what ethnicity and uh, groups, uh, tribal groups do they come from, uh, what are their uh, ethnic or kinship connections across borders, um, as well as how does the geography of Borno State in northeast Nigeria uh, impact the insurgency? I mean, d does it matter where this insurgency is happening? And I, I don't think there's been enough focus on some of these um, particular details. So um, my goal is to, to highlight some of these details and, and share some thoughts and and uh, hopefully open up a discussion um, that will lead to a better understanding of this insurgency, of this movement. So uh, hopefully down the road, um, the US, Nigeria, and uh, other European and West African allies uh, can work to address it and eventually uh, seek to mitigate it. So, um, so I'll start with uh, the first slides. As you can see, this uh, cover page uh, has the logo of uh, Boko Haram to the left and uh, Ansaru to the, uh, well, I guess the, the one that says Na Jamiatu Ahli Sunni Li Dawati Wal Jihad is Boko Haram. The one that's all in Arabic says Ansar al Muslimin fi Bilad is Sudan, and that would be Ansaru. Um, these are the two main uh, militant movements in northern Nigeria today. Uh, in terms of scale, the Boko Haram movement um, is certainly much larger. Uh, carrying out attacks is uh, carrying out attacks on a, almost a nearly daily basis. Uh, according to uh, statistics, it's been about 750 to 800 attacks since September 2010, which have uh, led to the deaths of more than 3,000 people and uh, injured thousands of others. Ansaru has only carried out um, you know, several attacks, uh, less than 10 that we know of, but they might have carried out some others. But uh, what makes Ansaru distinct is that they've only targeted foreign targets, um, kidnapping foreigners, uh, targeting Nigerian soldiers who were about to be deployed to Mali. Um, and then they did have one attack on, on a prison, actually, which is not a foreign target. But um, as, as we'll discuss today, their ideology is certainly more directed toward regional or uh, foreign interests, not specifically Nigeria-focused, as is Boko Haram. So the discussion outline um, will be an overview of Boko Haram and Ansaru, discuss the history of the northern Nigeria subregion, which I consider um, northern Nigeria, Chad, southern Niger, and northern Cameroon, uh, some of the geographic traits, physical and human. By human, we mean the people, the human terrain. And then, uh, time permitting, I'll discuss a little bit about how Al-Qaeda in Islamic Maghreb and one of their commanders, Mukhtar Bel Mukhtar, who's been the subject of a lot of discussion lately as to whether he's still alive, um, how Bel Mukhtar sought to bridge some of these geographic, physical, and human um, differences between Northern Africa and, and Western Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa. He seemed to have had a strategy to do that, which was uh, rather clever and he seemed to have succeeded to a decent extent. And then I'll provide some concluding remarks. So uh, in terms of the overview of, of Boko Haram, I think 
one of the key ways to view it is to note that there was um, there have been two main leaders of Boko Haram and they've steered the organization um, in ways particular to their leadership styles. Uh, the first leader of Boko Haram from 2002 until 2009 was Mohamed Youssef. Uh, he's from northern Nigeria, uh, from Yobe State, uh, some say Borno, but northeastern Nigeria, and he seems to have been trained in Chad and Niger uh, in terms of his religious studies. took over and became the leader of Boko Haram. Uh, at the time, Boko Haram didn't really have a name. And in fact, until 2009, 2010, Boko Haram never even really had a name. It was mostly people who followed Muhammad Yusuf, whether um, in the mosques, as you can see from one of the pictures there, he's giving a, a sermon, uh, or people that would um, follow his teachings through uh, CDs or through cassettes. Um, that was pretty much what his movement was. So it was called sometimes the Yusufia, or followers of Yusuf. Uh, at other times, they were called the Nigerian Taliban because Muhammad Yusuf uh, supported a religious interpretation similar to the Taliban. And in fact, in 2003, 2004, uh, several hundred of his followers set up a camp along the Niger border, um, which they called Afghanistan because the Taliban was their inspiration. Um, so I'd say that uh, because this group formed after 2001, which is after the U.S. war in Afghanistan started, the, the name of the Taliban became very widespread in international media. And it's probably through that that, um, that Yusuf was, found his inspiration in, in the Taliban. Um, he was, uh, and you can even see the younger picture of him in black and white, I believe is his passport photo. There was sort of a debate among that yes, you can go to a hospital and get medical training. Um, they would say yes, you can use Western science and so forth. But Yusuf was against all of that, um, arguing that it was against the Quran. And uh, but what relates to this black and white photo? is that uh, Yusuf still used a passport when he visited Saudi Arabia once, and the other imams would criticize him and say, oh, if you can't use any services of the illegitimate secular Nigerian state, uh, or not, or the illegitimate Nigerian state, uh, then how are you using their passport to go to Saudi Arabia? Um, because you're benefiting from their services. These are some of the spats that he had with other imams. Uh, in 2009, uh, as you can see in the two bottom photos, he was killed. Uh, by Nigerian security forces, as well as several hundred, perhaps up to 1,000 of his followers, after a raid in, um, in, in northeastern Nigeria against his followers. It's still unclear what caused this raid, but uh, you know, from 2003 to 2009, it wasn't a militant movement, but every so often there would be scuffles. Uh, sometimes people would, would be killed. Um, but it wasn't uh, consistent scuffles. But in 2009, there seemed to have been an effort on the behalf of the Nigerian security forces to eliminate his following, um, possibly because his following was getting very large, um, possibly because they believed that Yusuf was uh, secretly preparing to launch an insurgency anyway, so they wanted to uh, preempt it. Um, but President Yar Adua at the time said we need to crush them while he was on a trip to Brazil, and, and so the Nigerian security forces did. They, they crushed him, they killed Yusuf, um, but they martyred him. Uh, this was extrajudicially, um, you can see the picture there, and several other hundred of his followers were killed. Estimates say that he had up to 280,000 followers. Uh, it's hard to verify exactly how many, but they did come from neighboring countries as well as Nigeria. You can imagine if 1,000 followers get killed, several, several hundred, if not several thousand others get uh, imprisoned, uh, that all of them have many brothers and uh, people that they prayed with and have a lot of networks, and it would likely spark a lot of rage. So that's why between July 2009, when Yusuf was killed, and July 2010, when Shekau, his deputy, emerged, um, you can imagine how Boko Haram became such a 
such a force uh, when his uh, followers sought revenge. So the second picture there is, is Abu Shakao. Shakao was Yusuf's deputy. And uh, immediately when he became leader and started to uh, show up in pictures and photos and do clandestine interviews, he you know, changed the whole imagery of Boko Haram from something of a, like Yusuf, always dressed like an imam. And then afterwards, Shikau was always dressed in military fatigues. And that was the very first photo that he was featured in when he, he reemerged. He was actually believed to have been killed by the Nigerian security forces in July 2009. Um, so when he first showed up in this photo here, they said it was a fake. Um, again, you can see, uh, you know, pre-2009, guys like Shikau, uh maybe he was radical, maybe he was a little crazy, uh, and wasn't widely accepted, but he had a following. Uh, you can see these two photos are from pre-2009. But afterwards, uh, he's strictly been in military fatigue, so it's been a major change in imagery uh, for Boko Haram. Um, so I just want to show these uh, photos to emphasize the dichotomy between pre-2009 Boko Haram and uh, post-2009 uh, Boko Haram. Um, and since 2010, Boko Haram has been carrying out attacks against uh, mostly government offices, police stations, um, churches, border posts, um, and uh, schools, uh, beer halls, and so forth. Now, Ansaru, uh, when we look at their history, and this is still part of uh, the general overview, um, but their origins seem to date back to the mid-2000s when Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, then called the uh, Salafist Group for Preaching and Combat, or GSPC. Um, so Al so uh, GSPC was based in, in, in the Maghreb and Algeria, Mauritania, Morocco, uh, Algeria, and there were Nigerians who were members of the GSPC back then in Algeria. There were uh, Nigerian members, Chadian members, Algerians, Moroccans, Western Saharans, probably, and Mauritanians. And it seems that during the mid-2000s, some of these Nigerians uh, made connections with um, what would then become Akim and that these connections endured over the years. And uh, in 2011, when, or in the late 2000s, uh, until around 2011, as Akim started expanding southwards into the Sahel, um, towards Niger, towards Nigeria, they used some of these Nigerian members to expand their operations into Nigeria which is a, a very wealthy market for a kidnapping criminal enterprise like Akim. Uh, so, for example, the founder of uh, Ansaru, or the suspected founder of Ansaru, and the man who is believed to have orchestrated the attack in Kebi, featured in this spot. Uh, he, he was fighting with Mukhtar Belmokhtar in the mid-2000s, and, uh, and then he seemed to have been uh, very much responsible for at least starting the spate of kidnappings in northern Nigeria since mid-2011. So far, there's been um, about five kidnappings of foreigners and several other failed operations, and they've all been done um, with expertise. So, so the key to know about Ansaru is it's basically targeting foreigners, trying to kidnap them, and uh, originally, it was trying to seems to be that they were trying to sell them uh, for hostage money, but as the French intervention in Mali has begun, uh, it seems that they've changed their demands to more focus on the political aspects, such as um, that French France must stop the intervention. So it seems to be uh, coordinated with um, with Akim's objectives even to the present. Um, but the most uh, recent phenomenon, and this is the final slide of the overview, uh, is that it seems that in just recent months that there's been a sort of synthesis of Boko Haram and Ansaru. And there could be several reasons to explain this, one of them being that the two groups likely had members, uh, very likely had members in Mali. They've likely come into contact with each other. Ansaru was originally a group that split from Boko Haram, so they have networks going back several years with each other, 
the split was uh, largely, according to Ansaru, because uh, Boko Haram killed too many innocent Muslims in its attacks. Um, but it seems like it's also very tactical, as I mentioned. A Boko Haram targets Nigerian targets, uh, whereas Ansaru targets foreign targets. And that was likely um, even a bigger part of their rift than what Ansaru claims in its public statements when it says that it was about killing innocent Muslims. So that might be true. Um, but lately, you know, Boko Haram never carried out uh, kidnappings. But uh, they did kidnap this seven-member French family in northern Cameroon um, just two months ago, which I've highlighted on the screen. Um, and they've claimed it, and Chacao has also claimed it. And previously, Boko Haram had always denied kidnappings, said that's not what we do. So the fact that they are taking on uh, Ansaru's strategy of kidnapping seems to mean that there's somewhat of a synthesis Moreover, Ansaru has been carrying out operations in Boko Haram's um, area of operations in northeastern Nigeria. So it seems like there's been more overlap. Um, and, and it seems likely that they might be uh, beginning to come together and, and bridge, their, uh, bridge some of their, their differences. So and unfortunately, this French family still remains captive of uh, Boko Haram. So, and, and another important point on that is that the father of this uh, French family, uh, he has his kids, wife, and brother there, um, the fa or, or, or maybe brother-in-law. The father is also working for an energy company. And all of Ansar's kidnappings, I believe every single one, has been of uh, men working for energy companies. So, and they've, infil they've usually infiltrated the companies. So it seems like Boko Haram's adopted Ansar's strategy there. So, getting to the some of the main topics here, um, just about the human geography. I think the key point, uh, sorry, uh, physical geography, um, or history rather. Uh, the, the key historical point as it relates to Boko Haram and northern Nigeria is that uh, there's, I guess you could say, two main cultural, ethno-cultural zones of northern Nigeria. Uh, one would be um, kind of the Borno sphere of influence, which you can see on that um, black and white map. And the other would be this sort of um, Sokoto or Sultan of Sok Sokoto sphere of influence. Um, and these sphere of influences date back to the time of Usman Dan Fodio, who's uh, pictured there. And uh, essentially, there were two different caliphates or empires in uh, northern Nigerian history. There's main caliphates in northern Nigerian history over the last 1,000 years. Um, Borno is in the northeast of Nigeria, and which is also represented by that red circle in the middle map. And uh, the Sokoto Caliphate is generally represented by that blue circle on the map. And uh, Don Fodio, he established the Sokoto Caliphate in uh, the very early 1800s. Um, by waging um, a jihad or a holy war, and uh, he felt that this uh, was necessary, similar to Boko Haram today, in order to purify uh, the region, um, rid, all, rid all corruptions, rid all corruption. And he felt that just being a Muslim was was not sufficient; that you also had to wage jihad. So he waged a jihad against the uh, the Sultan of Borno at the time, um, but Borno was able to uh, successfully resist. So up until the time of uh, British and French uh, colonization, you had um, two main political entities in northern Nigeria, um, including Borno and uh, Sokoto. And whereas uh, the Sokoto Caliphate, which was uh, much larger and in the northeast, the uh, northwest. Um, was mostly uh, ethnic Hausa Fulani. The Hausas and Fulanis blended in so much that you can almost call them the Hausa Fulanis today, and they mostly speak uh, Hausa. Whereas in northeastern Nigeria, in Borno State, um, it's most of the people know Hausa today, but um, they are essentially uh, Kanuris. And the Kanuri ethnicity is actually where Boko Haram's home base is. And, um, We'll move on. And um, so we'll see that there has been a, a sort of uh, ethnic kinship in Boko Haram among Kanuris in particular. And just as back in the day, there was some resentment toward the Sultan 
towards uh, towards Usman Danfodio and the Sultans of Sokoto uh, because Buono had resisted them. Even today, you see some evidence of Boko Haram resi uh, resisting and rejecting the Sultan of Sokoto's influence. Although in general, Boko Haram rejects all traditional influences. But how this is relevant to Boko Haram ideology, um, as I've come to research and understand it, is that um, when Northern Nigerians look back at their history, at least uh, you know on an intellectual level, they they see that in you know 200 years ago they were rather strong. The the Sultan of Borno, uh, Sultanate of, of Borno, lasted. Uh, you know that empire lasted for almost 700, 800 years. Uh, the Sultanate of Sokoto was very powerful and influenced other um, Islamist states or jihadist states throughout West Africa. And at that time, Lagos and southern Nigeria was uh, a sort of backwater. But after the British came in, oh, I mean, the Portuguese were the first one to really start to colonize Nigeria. But after the British really intensified the colonization and started bringing uh, Western schools and missionary schools up to northern Nigeria and introducing the English language and expanding trade with La uh, Lagos and, and other parts of coastal Nigeria, there became a power shift in, in the region, whereas the, the Muslim states in the north used to be more powerful. As time went on, the, what, the people who then would become Christians after British colonization then became wealthier, more connected internationally, and more powerful. And I think that the northern Nigerians um, tend to have resented this um, and have faulted um, the British colonization for changing the power equation within their sub-region um, and overthrowing the um, Islamic caliphates, um, introducing English language, uh, Christian schools, and also after the British colonization many uh, Christians actually migrated up towards um, northern Nigeria so it's um, I see in from some people's perspectives, it's more diluted religiously. It's more heterogeneous, and um, and northern Nigerians sometimes resent that their identity, the identity of their region, has changed. And this relates to the United States, and uh, the reason why Boko Haram actually particularly talks about the United States, I think, is because after the uh, Cold War, when or after the World War II, rather, when um, British power internationally receded. Uh, the United States became a global power and because Nigeria is an Anglophone country uh, the United States was quite um, influential in Nigeria and even today you have things like Nollywood uh, which is the Bollywood of Nigeria influenced on um, America's Hollywood but so our influence is quite strong in Nigeria um, largely because of language perhaps religion too and uh, and also because We've been the main uh, symbols of democracy throughout the world, at least through democracy promotion programs. And as a result of Nigerian democracy, it seems that, and Nigeria's become a democracy for the past 12 years after uh, start and stop efforts for the past several decades. Um, and in the Nigerian democratic system, although the country's about half Christian and half Muslim, President Goodluck Jonathan, who's a Christian, or any other Christian presidential candidate, is likely to win uh, for the foreseeable future. The main reason being that uh, the Christians have a much higher voter turnout than, than the Muslims, and therefore when the presidential elections occur uh, in the past 12 years, Christians have generally taken about 60% of the vote to the Muslim candidates, 30%, even though uh, they're Muslims and Christians are about half and half. And it's not that all Christians vote Christian, all Muslims vote Muslim, Muslim, but that's the tendency. So as a result of this American democracy, as some northern, northern Nigerians see it, um, Christians will be perpetually in power as president unless they seek to not run for the presidency because of what they have in Nigeria called a uh, rotational presidency system. So I think this also leads to some of the resentment against um, the United States, particularly as it translates to the most extreme measure in Boko Haram. And just one interesting photo that I'd point out is the one of President Jonathan on the bottom of the screen there. And he wears um, a sort of American style uh, cowboy hat. And this has even been sometimes criticized among his own southern uh, ethnic 
uh, people, the Ijaw, but also it's seen among the northern Nigerians, uh, some northern Nigerians as sort of a symbol of his, you know, American influence, you know, not wearing a traditional Nigerian gown. So it's just kind of a uh, symbol. Um, that northern Nigerians kind of look back to their history uh, when they were powerful. The last time they were powerful uh, was at the time that um, the son of Usman Danfodio named Ahmed Ubelo was alive. Um, and then now they see that they're poor. They're poorer than the south. Uh, they're, they don't have as much power in the region. Um, there's poverty. There's corruption. And so it seems that if they wanted to change the system to empower themselves, they would look back to the last time they were powerful when they had an Islamic state, and uh, that's also Boko Haram's goal. Um, so it's kind of the dynamics of, of the whole ideology as it relates to history. And just as the old Bornoans resented the Sokoto Caliphate, um, so does Boko Haram today, although it also rejects the entire traditional religious leadership of Nigeria. Uh, which they feel has conspired with this democratic system to end up oppressing the Muslims of northern Nigeria anyway. So um, Boko Haram wants to take the power out of the hands of the traditional leadership and make them merely perhaps symbolic characters and uh, place the religious authority uh, in themselves. Um, right. Um, yeah, and I'll yeah, I'll address some, some questions related to the dichotomy between um, Boko Haram and Ansar later uh, as it pertains to um, Boko Haram focusing internally while Ansar focusing on foreigners. Um, as a heads up on that, I would say that um, Ansar, um, although it broke away from Boko Haram uh, and it was originally a Nigerian group, uh, it's been it's been infiltrated by outside forces much more than Boko Haram. Boko Haram originated uh, in northern Nigeria, whereas Ansar was plucked by al-Qaeda in Islamic Maghreb and steered towards this kind of anti-foreigner attacks. But I'll get to that later. I, I noticed some questions coming up. Yeah. Um, all right, and as for the, the issue of p petroleum, yeah, I think that um, that also relates to uh, the Boko Haram uh, insurgency in the north and the south. In the south, yeah, just to make a comparison between um, the Boko Haram insurgency and the MEND insurgency, um, MEND is really about poverty. Um, MEND means movement for the emancipation of the Niger Delta, and there's been other militant groups in the south. When they, when they speak, they say, we're about poverty. You're, uh, you're taking our oil. You're taking it from our land. Uh, you're, you're destroying the environment and we are now waging attacks in order to reclaim our land, reclaim our oil, and get our fair share. Because the insurgents in the South, predominantly Christian South, view that as theirs and they're not getting their fair share. Boko Haram hasn't really spoken about oil. It actually almost has never ever spoken about um, poverty. Um, but uh, there is a general perception among the people in, in the northern region that the government is stealing uh, from them. And while this is not necessarily uh, a complaint of Boko Haram, it does uh, make the operational environment better for them because there's a lot of discontented people in the north. Um, but I'll, I'll touch on that later. Um, right. and, and, um, and as for the Sultan of Sokoto, um, he, he's actually he's a real moderate uh, figure who's encouraging Christian uh, Muslim understanding. That's a picture of him there, and he is doing his best to preach for understanding between the religions. Um, and then that's actually another reason why Boko Haram is likely so against him because uh, they want to rid the country of this very moderating influence. Um, and. Uh, and he's actually even offered it, you know, advocated for an amnesty for Boko Haram. But so far, Boko Haram's not yet to take it up and has actually carried out attacks in Sokoto as a message to the Sultan and tried to assassinate virtually all other important religious traditional leaders in northern Nigeria. Um, 
but I, the Sultan's very influential among northern Nigerians in general, but um, those who follow Boko Haram have rejected his influence and consider him a hypocrite for um, collaborating with um, President Jonathan in democratic elections, for example. Um, and this gets uh, closer to Dr. Medalis' note in the questions there. Um, is Here you have the group, uh, just a comparison, is uh, Mujwa, which you may have heard of um, in Mali, and Ansaru. And uh, you see them both just in their statements. I wanted to use a comparison, harking back to Usman Donfodio. Now, Mujwa was a Mali-based group. Ansaru is a Nigeria-based group. Um, but as I'll discuss at the very end, it seems to me that both groups were actually created by Al-Qaeda in Islamic Maghreb uh, in order to carry out Akim's objectives throughout the region. In the case of Mudra, more towards um, Western Africa, Mauritania, Senegal, Southern Mali, whereas Anthuru seems to have been part of Akim's objectives to spread in Nigeria. Uh, so therefore, Akim is very internationalist oriented, carrying out attacks on foreigners, and this is why, in my opinion, uh, Ansaru has carried out attacks on foreigners, because really it's doing it because that is how it was trained to do so by Akim, even if its members were initially Nigerian Boko Haram members. But again, this is going back to history. These groups cite history in their statements. And while I don't claim that all the members of these groups understand this history or know about this history deeply, this does provide some intellectual cover um, for the insurgency. Um, and now just to touch on some aspects of uh, physical geography, moving on from uh, history. Um, I think we all know where Nigeria is, and you can see it on the map here. But I think one of the more interesting points that, um, okay, um, that that everyone should focus on is just that Maiduguri is in the northeast of Nigeria, uh, close to three border points, uh, Niger up north. Uh, this might not be an international movement, this might be a Nigerian insurgency, but when you're that close to three border points, um, there's going to be uh, some type of uh, influence. And in Boko Haram's case, it's members from different countries uh, joining the movement, it's uh, getting arms from across borders, particularly post-Libya Qaddafi crisis. Um, it is using those countries as hideouts. Uh, that's been um, really used by Boko Haram. Uh, and the other countries seem to be slightly afraid to crack down on Boko Haram in their countries. Because if they do, if Niger cracks down on Boko Haram, and, and Niger has, I should say, arrested Boko Haram members in its territory. But the more that they do that, the more it's likely that Boko Haram will respond, uh, possibly by attacking, for example, Nigerian police or Nigerian churches. And Boko Haram has recently carried out the kidnapping in Cameroon and threatened to attack Cameroon more. So these are some of the border dynamics. Um, I'll be discussing some of the human relationships across borders um, in the next section. Um, and just to show how this physical geography relates to history, um, I just want to say that uh, you know Lake Chad used to be a lot bigger than it is today, and there was you know a fairly successful civilization around. earlier, which, which en ended up resisting the Sokoto uh, Empire, was, was based in that Lake Chad region. And while now the region's rather desolate and poor, back in the day it was uh, rather prosperous. So this is part of why I think Boko Haram harks back to history, um, because this is the last time that they were empowered um, on a regional or international uh, scale. Um, and, and my main point here is just to show that this this I don't know if there was an empire that lasted for a longer time in uh, sub-Saharan African history than the Kanem Borno Empire, which lasted for several hundred years, um, up until uh, first uh, Rabi Fadallah came from Sudan um, via Central Africa to conquer Borno in 1893, um, and then France defeated him in 1900, and I showed a picture of that there. But uh, basically, the Kanem Borno Empire lasted until. Uh, around 1900 and was ultimately overtaken by France um, in Cameroon because in the Cameroon part and then eventually uh, Britain in the Nigeria part. 
Um, so, so that's where we're looking at physically. Now, although Nigeria is usually seen as a kind of West African um, country and you know coastal country, in fact, you know when you look at Borno, Borno's historical trajectory, it's really you know in the heart of Central Africa, as I've noted on this um, map here. Um, and I mean, if history worked out a little different, maybe you Lake Chad could be called Lake Borno today, as I noted in that other map. But Borno, it's like right at the end of these river systems in uh, Africa. Uh, back in the day when people went on the Hajj, the pilgrimage to Mecca from Mali, they basically had to pass through Borno on the way to Mecca. Um, Borno was also the last trading stop if you wanted to head up to the Fezzan in Libya. So although today Borno's not the type of place that everybody knows on the map, um, back in the day it had a very important a strategic location on these um, pilgrimage and other trade routes as a major hub where many different cultures and ethnicities um, you know interacted and a lot of it has to do with um, its its geographic location but I think the key point I would make on this is that um, we think of Nigeria as very West African coastal but from the perspective of Borno their main base is very kind of central African and, and not necessarily closely affiliated with Lagos per se. And uh, you know, on this map I've highlighted that in fact uh, the typical um, you know, person from Borno would likely feel ethnically, religiously, uh, culturally and physically closer to places like Sudan and Libya than they might to Lagos. And from my recent trip to Borno it's so common to meet someone who says their grandparents came from the Sudan uh, or came from Chad, or that they went to Khartoum last month to trade um, some goods. But Lagos, on the other hand, the, ca uh, the economic capital of Nigeria, feels so much farther away, um, even though they're in the same country. So when we, when we look at Borno itself, the base of Boko Haram, um, we need to also consider associating it with other parts of Sub-Saharan Africa uh, beyond what the colonial made borders uh, have made make us inclined to think that it's close to Lagos. Um, and then some other aspects of the physical terrain are you have the Mandara Mountains um, on the border between um, Nigeria and Cameroon. Uh, this affects the insurgency, the Boko Haram insurgency, and that Boko Haram has, that was actually the first base where Boko Haram carried out attacks in 2003 when it was not much of a militant group then. But uh, even now, a lot of the worst Boko Haram attacks are happening in Adamawa state, where Boko Haram members are attacking the borderline of Nigeria and Cameroon on the Nigerian side, likely using these Mandara Mountains as bases where they can come down and carry out attacks on the borders of Adamawa and go back into the mountains of Cameroon. Um, so that's a part of the physical terrain that's affecting the insurgency. Uh, you have the Lake Chad Four border region. That's been a hub for weapons going back from Chad to Borno state or, or uh, from Cameroon. Um, Boko Haram has also taken refuge in Chad, so um, you have that kind of lake in the border region of Borno, uh, which is affecting the insurgency. And you have desert in Niger and Chad uh, and Cameroon. Um, the bottom picture is of uh, Abu Shakao, the leader of Boko Haram, in a desert we don't know where. But Borno's desert's fairly small, so it's very possible that he found uh, refuge in a desert in Niger or Mali. And many Boko Haram members have uh, found refuge in na neighboring uh, nearby desert regions. Um, the desert is not, um, as I imagine, completely sandy like a beach, but it's kind of a hard desert, so it's very easy to kind of travel on even without roads. And in fact, that French family that was kidnapped recently was captured on one of these non-existent roads in the desert, and then you can just take them anywhere. Nobody travels by um, asphalt roads there. In terms of the human uh, relationships, um, there are many ethnicities in Nigeria, several hundred. In terms of northern Nigeria, you have um, the Hausas are the dominant ethnicity. Pretty much everybody will speak Hausa language, even if they're not an ethnic Hausa. Uh, you have the Shua Arabs, um, and most Boko Haram members, at least in terms of their propaganda videos, do speak Hausa, I mean, do speak Arabic. Um, Many of the younger people in Borno State, when I was there, they spoke Arabic because they had um, perhaps been to Saudi Arabia on education.
in northern Cameroon, Arabic is also the lingua franca. Everybody knows Arabic in northern Cameroon. So naturally, people in Borno will also know Arabic well. And this kind of extends the relationships of Borno state people to Sudan and other Arabic parts of the world. And related to the insurgency, this uh, helps them to get funding. Some of the initial sponsors were Sudanese, for example. It also connects them greater with Akim and other militant groups throughout the Arab world because of their linguistic links. The Kanuris are the main base ethnicity of Borno State. Uh, Boko Haram's leader, Shakao, uh, is a Kanuri. I believe he used Kanuri in actually a video recently. Um, but And the Kanuris extend through that Lake Chad region. Um, and that sort of differentiates them from the houses, um, as I'll get to in a moment. And then you also have the Anglo-Francophone divide, whereas Nigerians are uh, English speaking as the country's language. All around it, you have a sea of French. And uh, But Boko Haram and other northern Nigerians can overcome these national linguistic divides because of their ethnic kinships and the languages that cross uh, between them. And there's a lot of intermarriage and whatnot. Um, but related to this Kanuri House issue that I've been uh, harking on, you see um, in this quote, for example, that there is some type of ethnic dimension to the Boko Haram insurgency, where the leader, Shakao, was favoring Kanuris over non-Kanuris. Um, many of the political sponsors of Boko Haram have actually been Kanuri politicians. So, there's, so there is this uh, element to the group. Um, I'll, and in fact, uh, part of the Boko Haram Ansaro split was also likely caused because the Ansaru members were uh, are mostly from the northwest, who are House of Fulani's who rejected this Kanuri influence. I'll get that uh, to that in a second. Uh, w one point, which is just a little bit of an aside, Boko Haram has never carried out an attack in southern Nigeria, despite um, that it has been interested to do so. Um, based on the statements of its members, and some members captured planning attacks there or seen scouting for attacks there. And largely, this is because you know a lot of Boko Haram's major attacks involve 50 to 100, 150 people. It's not that easy to get 150 people of a different religion and ethnicity into. Um, and now, highlighting um, another issue is. Uh, the distance from uh, Sokoto State in northern Nigeria to Mali is very close, uh, something like 230, 250, 300 miles, depending on uh, which borders you're using. Um, but uh, what's significant about this is that um, you know Akim was based in Gao recently until it got kicked out. Before that, even when Mali hadn't fell apart, there were uh, brigades of Akim operating around Gao. And Akim had a goal to expand in the southern Sahel because they could um, access more um, more uh, Western companies there. Uh, moreover, in recent years, GPS technology has become much better, so it's been easier for desert militants to find hideouts and uh, store weapons and whatnot. Um, so, to, to basically to make more money, uh, groups like Akim wanted to expand into Nigeria as well, and they were they were very close to Nigeria. So uh, getting to one of these final points is that that Akim seems to have, like guys like Bel Mokhtar, have plucked uh, Boko Haram members over the past three years, um, or even earlier, and brought them to Mali and Mauritania for trainings. Uh, and there's, of course, ideological infiltration. Made them specialists in kidnapping, which is why Ansaru has carried out kidnappings with um, elite skill. Um, and then sent these Nigerians back to Nigeria to carry out attacks since 2011. Um, and um, it seems that during this process, uh, Boko Haram led by Shikau, um there seemed to have been some conflict, likely related to how money was uh, spent, or likely because um, if Shakao had allowed his fighters to go up to Akim for training. He hoped that they would come back and carry out attacks on Nigerian targets, but they ended up carrying out attacks on foreign targets, which Shikau did not approve of, at least until recently. So um, part of this close distance with Akim has actually led to some troubles within um, Boko Haram and Ansaru. Um, and that, that's just sort of a final issue, which I'll leave open. But that's kind of the theory I'm developing at this point 
about how Boko Haram and Ansaru split. And um, that was kind of fun for me just to rehash a lot of thoughts. I hope it was insightful, and I welcome... Thanks. Um, yeah, in terms of the um, ethnic makeup of Boko Haram, um, it's, 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 it's multiple ethnicities. I mean, their former spokesman, Abu Kaka, whose picture I showed, um, he, was a, he was from Kogi State um, in southern Nigeria. I showed a guy who was a Yoruba, the Suleiman Muhammad, who used to be their commander for the southwest zone. He, he's ethnic Yoruba. So they, they do have multiple ethnicities. And this is why I think even if Boko Haram is a Kanuri-based organization, they cannot portray themselves as a Kanuri insurgency any more than the Taliban can say we're a Pashtun insurgency, because they need recruits from other ethnicities. Um, so really, you do have multiple ethnicities in Boko Haram, plus people from Niger, Cameroon, and Chad. Um, and, they, and they do portray their insurgency as one of Muslims of Nigeria. Um, even if it's kind of Kanori led um, uh, at, at the heart. Um, and yes, Boko Haram can, can recruit. Uh, I'm answering the questions here. Um, Boko Haram can recruit among the Hausa. They have many Hausa members. Um, but it does seem that some Hausa members and members of other ethnicities have become disaffected from Boko Haram because of Shakao's favoritism of Kanuris. And therefore, some may have been attracted to groups like Ansaru or maybe have just left Boko Haram or perhaps formed their own militias that we don't really know about. Um, so I wouldn't say that um, Boko Haram has excluded houses or that houses are not interested, but some have likely become disaffected from the group. Um, yeah, um, to answer another question, yeah, um, there's uh, regarding extraction of oil from Lake Chad, yeah, I think that's a really uh, interesting point. Some people have spoken about the um, kind of Boko Haramization of the Lake Chad oil. Um, I, I'm not sure how much they found in Nigeria's portion of Lake Chad yet, but certainly there's expectations that some might come from Nigeria. Um, and, and I think more has been found in neighboring countries in terms of oil from Lake Chad. But one of the issues is, if oil does uh, get found in the Lake Chad region, this will really empower a group like Boko Haram to carry out kidnappings or to at least force businesses to pay Boko Haram money in order for Boko Haram not to disrupt their operations. And some people suggest that some of the local sponsors of Boko Haram now are foreseeing in the future that it's good to have a group like Boko Haram on your side. So you can pay them off now in order to protect you later. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm just uh, answering questions one by one, um, uh, as I see them written here. But um, but yeah, lake, the lake, if there's oil in Lake Chad, it'll really affect the Boko Haram insurgency. Even now, you, you see evidence of um, wealthy businessmen either and wealthy politicians even in, in the past paying off Boko Haram to carry out kind of attacks against the rival businessmen or rival uh, politicians. So if oil gets in there, it's going to really complicate things. Um, as much as, and, and you know, it's important to note, poverty, poverty is not something Boko Haram has addressed ever. So it's not clear the extent to which Boko Haram ideologically cares about poverty, even if money can be used as a recruiting tool. For example, paying $60 to uh, Boko Haram recruits to carry out an attack. But if there's money in that region, it, it can really lead to um, some unpredictable and uh, consequences. And at this time, it looks like it could lead to insecurity. Um, and um, I'll just get to another question, and I'll get to them all. Uh, in, in the border region, I, I yeah, the Almajiri school system I didn't touch on in this presentation, but there are about seven to ten million Almajiri uh, school children in northern Nigeria. Almajiri uh, derives from the Arabic word muhajir or uh, muhajirin which means uh, immigrant or uh, migrator. And so ma muhajir, majiri, in the local language. And it refers, majiri refers to these you know, young boys, 7, 12 years old, whose parents don't tend not to have enough money to feed them. So they send them to the cities 
where they get taken in by a malam or local religious leader and in return for begging for alms in the streets uh, the money of which they give back to their Islamic teacher they receive some shelter and some food from the Islamic teacher um, but it's completely informal um, Boko Haram as well as some other more radical people in northern Nigeria reject efforts to formalize the um, Nigeria school system and President Goodluck Jonathan wants to formalize it as opposed to making it completely informal um, but uh, but the tradition throughout history of northern Nigeria for hundreds of years, it's been this informal mechanism to learn religious education. Uh, but, it, but they don't learn anything related to the math or the science or secular or education or sciences. And there's concerns that these Nigeri school children are very vulnerable to be recruited into groups like Boko Haram uh, because they don't have you know, family support with them. And if their imam who supports them is corrupted by Boko Haram or paid off by Boko Haram, it's very easy for the imam to simply, you know, give away several of his Majiri kids to um, to the Boko Haram or other militia or other militias, even before Boko Haram, uh, politicians would use the Majiri kids just to go rough up rivals or um, destroy a rival's office or something by buying them out for a day, kind of like a rent a militia man. Um, so this is something that would really need reform. And um, and yes, I saw tons of Majiris in my in my travels, and um, they're begging for money, and um, and I, I think it is it is uh, an issue, um, and, and that is one example of Boko Haram recruitment dynamics. In addition to the fact that they're poor, and it's easy to pay them off. I mean, not everyone, but you can pay people off to carry out um, attacks, and Boko Haram bank robberies, for example. If you participate in one and you succeed, you can make enough money to last almost a lifetime. Boko Haram also steals a lot of cars, which it uses in suicide bombings, or which it sells um, to like politicians even. So that's another source of money making for the group. And again, if you can get a poor person who's um, more susceptible to this, they can carry out these kind of attacks for you. Um, so. Um, so I'm just answering uh, some some of the questions I'm seeing here um, regarding re extending this recruitment into northern Cameroon. Uh, the key related to northern Cameroon is that beyond the ethnic, physical, cultural kinships that I've discussed uh, earlier, um, northern Cameroon too um, is you know the political system is more favorable to people from the south. It tends to be predominantly Christian in the south, predominantly Muslim in the north. Um, and so some of the same types of ideological uh, roots of the Boko Haram insurgency certainly extend to northern Cameroon. And because they're the same languages, same cultures, uh, some major Boko Haram leaders have been from Cameroon, for example. It's, it's, it's kind of the prime area for Boko Haram uh, infiltration. Um, operationally and in terms of recruitment and there's been a lot of reports of Boko Haram strategically sending people in there to recruit um, but uh, and uh, yeah I think I think that's that's kind of a very dangerous uh, kind of a, a red zone in that it's 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 worrisome that Boko Haram could infiltrate um, northern Cameroon um, I, I also think if I'm not mistaken the kind of um, Saudi-influenced religious schools entered Nigeria about a decade before they entered Cameroon. So the extent that, okay, I'm going to wrap up in five, ten minutes. The extent that um, Saudi kind of religious schools end up creating this kind of Salafist us versus them uh, re religious dichotomy, it seems that that might hit Cameroon at a later time than Nigeria. So it's something to watch out for more of the midterm uh, if some insurgency like this can take off in Cameroon, but it's something to watch out for. Um, so, so that's what I would say about recruitment in northern Cameroon. Um, in terms of the Sudanese style split between, yeah, five, five minutes, uh, be, the Sudanese split between Cam um, northern and southern Nigeria, one thing is to the extent that Boko Haram was initially um, kind of sponsored by northern politicians who would not want to see Nigeria lose its oil wealth from the south. Uh, that's unlikely that Boko Haram or anyone would advocate for a split because Boko Haram sponsors would suffer from less oil wealth if it was all concentrated in the south. If there were a lot of oil in uh, the Lake Chad region, 
and there was enough wealth for northern northern Nigeria to be sustainable on its own and Boko Haram sponsors could make more money by splitting, then possibly that would become more likely. Uh, although at present, there doesn't seem to be evidence of a Sudanese-style um, north-south split at this time. But, but things could get worse, especially as the southern uh, Niger Delta insurgents carry out attacks uh, if they start revamping and carrying out attacks. Um, but yeah, uh, so uh, other issues um, I think I've discussed. Uh, Sultan of Sogoto. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, just getting back to the issue of oil. Yeah, I mean, I think oil kind of makes everything go round in Nigeria in some way or another. So you can't divorce oil from the Boko Haram insurgency or, or political maneuverings. Um, if there were oil in Lake Chad, I think, yes, some politicians would resent Boko Haram for uh, interfering with it. But at the same time, some politicians might seek to exploit Boko Haram to kind of attack rivals, rival companies. So I think it would just uh, create some chaos or somehow Boko Haram would need to kind of be paid off to, to stay away from that oil. But yeah, it could make things unpredictable. Um, Regarding the issue that I just want to get back to before I finish up in, in a couple minutes related to Ansaru and, and why they carry out foreigners. Um, yeah, I think, you know, the thing about um, is the U.S. misguided for focusing on Boko Haram and not Ansaru. The thing is, um, you know, at this time it seems that Ansaru's attacks are mostly tactical. Um, you know, once every two months, once every three months, the kidnapping. And they're definitely a much more direct threat to foreign interests, foreign companies. Um, and they could possibly extend their kidnappings throughout Nigeria to the south as well. Um, and for that reason, they're more of a direct concern to the US or to the west. Um, at the same time, Boko Haram's scale is so much more, and Boko Haram is so much more of a threat to the country's stability at this point. Um, and Boko Haram could also evolve into a group that attacks foreigners as well. So I think um, our efforts to kind of focus our resources, our energy, uh, our, our intelligence, counter-terrorism uh, communi counter communications against Boko Haram, it, it makes sense because just the scale and the magnitude is so much more than Ansaru. But um, on, a, on, a, on a micro level, we do need to be individual Americans or Westerners probably need to be more concerned about uh, Ansaru at this point towards foreign Western interests. Um, but, but we'll see how these groups evolve. Um, and, and again, um, as I said, Ansaru seems to be much less indigenous than Boko Haram. I'm sorry if I didn't answer all the questions. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak today. Um, I hope I got to uh, touch on some different issues. And I would be more than glad to uh, stay in touch. Um, Jay Hunt has provided an email uh, below with which you can get in touch with them with the CKC Speaker Series, whom I'd like to thank for inviting me here today. And then uh, we can continue this communication. There's always more opportunities to learn and share information um, and refine ideas or correct uh, flawed ideas or whatnot. So uh, appreciate this, this opportunity. Appreciate your appreciation of this opportunity. and. Um, Assalamu alaikum and see you next time. Thank you very much. Uh, before I let you go, Jacob, uh, one last question. Uh, if you can just have uh, yeah. one more, one thing that you'd like everybody to leave with, what would that? Oh. Um. <sighs> That's a tough question. Um, I, I would say that you know I think um, I consider Nigeria uh, as as an ally of the United States, as a friend of the United States. Um, even if we have different kind of regional ambitions and we each have our own superiority complexes at times, but um, I think that there's a lot of room for the United States to work with Nigeria, both Muslims and Christians, um, both the followers of the Sultan, um, both, as well as these Nigerian students. Um, as well as um, other countries in West Africa um, to, to bring these uh, countries together to come up with a coordinated strategy to combat these types of uh, destabilizing influences. So I think, and, and the US, you know, we're, we're not like France that has a colonial legacy there. 
we can do something to bring these Franco Francophone and Anglophone countries like Nigeria together and develop a coordinated strategy for the region. I think it, you know, it's not too late. There's still opportunities to engage. And um, I think as long as we do it um, carefully and strategically, um, we can, we can uh, make the situation better. It's kind of an optimistic final note. Well, I think in the world today we need to